Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and happy Friday. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. We sure did talk about Joseph Pulitzer all week. For the whole week. And we sure did still have to leave out an awful lot. (laughs) Um, You could do a whole podcast series on Pulitzer because his name touches so many things. And also, there was just a lot that went on in his life that is sometimes fascinating, sometimes weird. We'll talk about a few of those things today. Uh, We mentioned that when William Randolph Hearst bought the New York Journal, that... Pulitzer's brother Albert was sort of involved, sort of. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had mentioned that Albert came over after Pulitzer had sort of gotten settled. Theirs is kind of a sad story because Albert also went into publishing, was actually pretty good at it by most accounts, but he just didn't have like the drive and ambition of his brother. So he really didn't, you know, he kind of fades in the background historically. Um, and the two were definitely in a situation where their relationship was quite strained um, because of the competition between them, which stinks. But um, Albert had owned the New York Journal. He sold it to a man named John McLean, not from Die Hard, obviously. And then John McLean turned around and sold it to Hearst. So there's also an interesting, like, just through line there of that Mm -hmm. having been Albert's paper that Hearst then used to drive down the world's numbers, which had to have been an extra layer of insult, probably. Mm -hmm. Related to the Hearst thing, and specifically the Yellow Kid, the artist that we mentioned that Pulitzer hired to replace Haute Colt, who his name I have heard pronounced many ways. We went with that pronunciation because it seems like most American uh, journalists that cover this story say it that way. If that's not the way you say it, I'm sorry. But uh, the artist we're actually talking about is George Luck, who replaced him at the world and started doing Hogan's Alley there. Mm -hmm. George Luck has this completely compelling painting career that I, he's another one that's on the list for me now because uh, he's just, he fascinates me. There's a photograph of him where what really struck me was that it looks like every um, artist photograph any of my friends that, like, work in art or in comics would have taken today. Like, Mm -hmm. the expression is there, that kind of wry, smart-alecky, but wonderful, really charming expression. I'm sort of obsessed with George Luck now. Um, We didn't mention it in the the show, but the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, which... Pulitzer left after that whole shooting incident. Mm-hmm. He he didn't sell it. He still had the Post Dispatch. And in our Chapin episode, we mentioned that he went to St. Louis for a while and worked there. Um, and that actually stayed in the Pulitzer family for a long time, like almost up until the 21st century. So just know that that wasn't an abandoned thing. Right. We also didn't talk about <laughs> this thing that happened. Again, we had to t- I had to take so much out because it was just ballooning. In 1900, Pulitzer's house in Manhattan burned essentially to the ground. He was not home at the time. Um, Kate was home, and she had, like, run back into the burning building, like, a couple of times to get the kids out. One of their governesses died in the fire because she had gone back in to get Christmas presents that she had left inside. Oh, no. It was, like, a big... Uh, tragedy. It's an interesting point for me in that I will say I I was reading about it and I had that moment of, mm-hmm, but then I was like, oh. Um, so Kate and the children then went to a Fancy Pants Unicorn Hotel to stay while they figured out their next house and they put up the staff in a boarding house. And I was like, of course the staff went to a boarding house. Um, but then the Pulitzers did some pretty interesting things in that Kate then had a tailor make all new wardrobes for all of the staff. Huh. Um, And Pulitzer donated a lot of money to the emergency services that had responded to the fire and tried to take care of people that were tangentially impacted by it. Like, I think that I'm don't quote me on this. I think that governess's family got a substantial amount of money Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Like, they were pretty benevolent in the way they handled everything in the aftermath. Mm -hmm. Still very very scary. 
And easy to do when you're richer than, yeah, you know. Yeah. One of the things I had noticed when trying to find a picture to put on our social media, needing two pictures because we have two parts, uh, is... I it, there was a surprising lack of like publicly available photos of him which surprised me based on when he lived in his prominence like usually somebody who was around at this point and was as prominent as he was there's just a wealth of photographs and formal portraits and all of this other stuff and th- I, there were just a lot fewer of them than I expected and many of the ones that were there are like scans of something that was printed in a book that obviously looks like a late 19th century book scan and not something like an an actual print of a photograph. And you had told me this is probably why. Yeah, a lot of things were destroyed in that fire. A lot of art that they had collected was destroyed in that fire. Um, portraits, there were definitely portraits mentioned, uh, both photographic portraits and some paintings of both Joseph and Kate and I think their children that were destroyed in that fire. I had also mentioned to you that um, there are places that, you know, have uh, archives of Pulitzer material. And in some cases, if they've scanned the actual material, you will see that it has burnt edges. Or in some cases, half of the document is burned away and it's kind of been pieced together by archivists what it likely said in the spaces that didn't exist. So we did lose a lot of details about him. And I wonder if that doesn't contribute to some degree to that sort of gap of understanding about his health. Mm hmm. It's really interesting to read about his health because it always seems that everyone who was close to him, I don't want to say they ignored his issues or his mentions of it, but no one thought he was in, like, an imminent health crisis. Like, no Mm -hmm. one was like, he could go at any moment. We need to be on constant watch. It was like, yes, he's always kind of had these issues, but he's fine. That's just how he is. Mm-hmm. Um, which makes it interesting that Kate was imp- impressed upon enough by that that telegram she got the the day before he died, or I think it was the day he died, where she was like, I have to get to South Carolina. Yeah. Um, we mentioned also that their marriage was not awesome. Um there was, I did not follow down this rabbit hole because it wasn't that interesting to me. And I don't like to, um, it just didn't feel right to like go through the salacious gossipy parts. Although uh, this is pretty well verified that Kate had for a while been romantically involved with one of the editors that worked for Pulitzer. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, clearly like theirs was not a relationship of like, constant affection at all um he was gone so much i think you know it's not surprising that Mm -hmm. that they became romantically attached to to others she did for sure i don't know that he ever did he was romantically attached to his work is what i think we also didn't talk about the code book in this episode, which is pretty interesting, but like it, it came up in Chapin's, so I feel felt like that in particularly was, in particular, felt like retreading old ground where he had this whole code book of words that he would use to communicate with his editors, so that if someone intercepted a telegram or something, they wouldn't know what was really going on. Mm-hmm. And that one of the things that I read that was kind of charming was that like it was considered you know, a badge of honor for an employee to have a copy of that code book because it was like, I'm in the inner circle now. I know what all the missives really mean, Um, which is kind of uh, fascinating. You know, people get very attached to their jobs and they become their identities and achievement at their job becomes what makes them feel important. I'm not Mm -hmm. saying you shouldn't feel good about doing good jobs. I don't know. I just have feelings on that issue that aren't necessary necessarily what everyone else would have. Um, We didn't talk a lot about Lucille's death either, which was, again, she was 17. So she was old enough that, you know, she was 
a, a significant part of the family and her health had been kind of up and down for several months. Mm -hmm. And they were scared she was going to die on Christmas Eve and she didn't. And she, you know, had even made sure that everybody had presents and stuff. And then she rallied, but she died on New Year's Eve. Um, and one biography I read made made a really interesting point that, like, Joseph Pulitzer had grown up with his siblings dying and his father dying and just, like, burying one family member after another. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of seemed like he had made this, for the most part, insulated world. They had lost that one child when she was a toddler. But other than that, you know, into his adult life, he had really kind of for lack of a better phrase, kept himself safe from that kind of heartache again. Mm -hmm. And there really is a moment where, like, after Lucille dies, which I think we had said was 1887, he seemed like he became more withdrawn from everyone else again. Like, that's really when he kind of starts living on the yacht most of the time and, like, yeah. kind of putting himself in this own cone of silence, even when he's not with the family. And I... um. I feel like he is one of those people that would have benefited so deeply from talking to a mental health professional. <laughs> well, and I, I, you know, all of the resources on earth could not have helped him at that yeah. point. Yeah. Well, and that, that whole incident in his newsroom, <sighs> like, as I was reading that, I was like, therapy, I think all of you. <laughs> I know therapy today versus when they were living not quite the same very different thing yes. but also man the fact that 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 whole bickering scenario I was like all of you needed to talk to somebody about how to deal with your angry feelings it was honestly like reading those newspaper jabs at each other back and forth felt like reading social media just a slower version where I was like you guys you're all very special and important you don't have to fight you're <laughs> You're all very valid, good boys. I don't, I don't know. I just, oh, the amount of bickering that led to somebody getting killed. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's where I'm like, mm. I will say this: Cockrell had a history of gun violence, mm -hmm. so it's not real surprising that he was ready to shoot Slayback. Um, he had been in duels and whatnot before. He was very quick to challenge people to duels that was never satisfactorily uh, solved isn't the right word because it wasn't considered like an investigative case but it's kind of like you know the Panama Canal thing sputtered out mm -hmm. there was never any conclusive determination and it it was like yeah there's no evidence so I guess this didn't happen or it's it's gone if it did there was just so much drama and scandal and strife around the Panama Canal and it it has come up over, I mean, just decades of history and multiple different episodes of the show. And I'm not sure if prior hosts ever did something that was like more of a comprehensive look at. I, it seems like there's something that has like is like way back in the archive that's also related. But man, it's just just whole saga of the Panama Canal. Yeah, it's it's hard to keep track of everything because so many people eventually had a stake in it and they were all trying to protect their own interests in ways that led them to lie about things that, like, untangling that particular mess is very, very difficult. I will tell you a funny thing to okay. end this on a more hilarious note. I don't often do this, but particularly <laughs> in thinking about Pulitzer and Hearst, without intending to, I cast actors in my head of who they are. I love this. And I realized I have always thought of this actor as Pulitzer for no reason I can figure out. And it's Guy Pierce. <laughs> I don't know why. Hearst is a little bit of a thing where my brain knows better, but still keeps making this same casting choice which is Gerald McRaney, who mm -hmm. I love. Um, mm -hmm. But he played George Hurst in Deadwood, mm. but my brain just went, Hurst, Hurst, Hurst. And so he's always William Randolph Hurst, even though he only ever played William's father, George. So I, those, are, those are the two men who are battling it out in my head when I envision these two titans of publishing fighting with each other. That's awesome. <laughs> 
So if anybody ever writes a Pulitzer biopic or directs it, please do everything you can to cast Guy Pierce in the role. That would be great <laughs> for my my mental well-being and uh, <laughs> would delight me on multiple levels. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so much Pulitzer. I feel like we could never cover all of Pulitzer, just like the Panama Canal. There's just too much. But that's those are two big pieces of his life um, that I think covered the the bigger moments in broad strokes. There are lots of other little business dealings and whatnot that merit investigation and discussion, but they can't all go in the, to in a week of show. Mm-hmm. That's what's up. Um, if this is the end of your week, your work week, and you have some time off ahead, marvelous. I hope it goes spectacularly well and that you um, think about media bias. <laughs> <laughs> when you go through the world because that kind of cracked me up that Pulitzer was all about unbiased journalism because you're unbiased if you agree with me um, <laughs> if you don't have time off and you had to do some work I hope you also have uh, at least some some restive moments some times where you can chill out and be with yourself in your cone of silence if you desire and uh, we'll be right back here tomorrow with a classic and then on Monday there will be another new episode so we'll see you right back here Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs> 